Thank you everyone who's joined us so far. Um, we're due to start at two o'clock. Uh, we're just going to wait a few more minutes for us to arrive um, and then we'll start the presentation. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's two o'clock, so uh, we're going to start the Slurry Wizard webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so this Slurry Wizard webinar will be uh, hosted by myself. I'm Grace Whitlow. I'm KT manager sitting within the environment team. Um, my contact details below. And it will also, uh, the demonstration of how the Slurry Wizard will be working will be my colleague David Ball uh, who's a senior manager in the environment team details are below uh, this webinar webinar will be recorded um, so if you have any connection issues or um, can't watch the whole thing you can always come back uh, and also you can share it with anyone else you think might be interested uh, you're also all on mute so don't worry we can't hear what you're doing um, the presentation itself will be around 45 minutes uh, with 15 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, there is a question uh, box on the screen that you can submit your questions. Um, please do this throughout the presentation as they pop into your head. Um, we'll try and read as much as we can out in, at the end of the presentation, um, but it's likely we might not be able to have time to answer all the questions. Any questions that we don't answer, we will follow up after the webinar 
um, and the questions and answers will be published on the HDB website. Uh, and don't forget, there's also CPD points available from attending this webinar uh, for Dairy Pro, Pig Pro, and for Basis. Um, how to ask a question um, if you haven't worked that out already. Uh, uh, there will be an or orange uh, arrow box on your screen. If you click on that, you'll see a drop down list uh, where there will be the questions and you can submit your question and press send there. Um, we won't be saying who said the question, um, so don't worry, we won't name shame what they are. Um, so just a little introduction, uh, what is the Slurry Wizard? Uh, the Slurry Wizard is an Excel spreadsheet tool um, which can calculate how much slurry that your farm will produce. Uh, it takes into account your herd numbers and your expected rainfall. Uh, you can then use those figures to compare how much slurry you are producing to the current slurry storage capacity that you have on farm. Um, it will give you a amount of days of how much storage you have for that period um, and you can also use it for um, looking at and exploring changes that you may be looking to make on the farm such as increasing your slurry storage. Um, some of the farm information that you'll be needed to input the slurry wizard is your herd numbers, uh, roof and yard areas, expected rainfall and the housing periods. Um, to access the Slurry Wizard, um, you just go on ahdb.org.uk and you will then go on to the Knowledge Library. Um, this will take you to our page which has a wealth of information. Uh, to find the Slurry Wizard, you'll use the filters. Uh, this example on my slides has dairy as a sector, but you can also find it using the pork sector. Then uh, under topic, we go down to buildings and that will take you to the next page and click on storage. Uh, and after that, click search. Um, once you get to this point, th this will filter down some of the more relevant pages. Um, you will be able to find the Slurry Wizard user guide as well as uh, what you'll see there is the Slurry Wizard. And once you get onto the Slurry Wizard page, uh, there's a bit of information about what the Slurry Wizard is. Um, and you just simply click down a Excel um, icon will probably appear on the bottom left of your screen, uh, maybe on the top right for Apple computers. Um, and then you just select open. Uh, this will then take you to open up your Excel spreadsheet. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to David um, and he's got some examples of how we use the actual tool itself. Good, thank you, Grace. Uh, that's um, that's useful. Thank you. Um, so I'm uh, David Ball from AHDB's uh, um, uh, environment team, and so I'm uh, going to take you through the Slurry Wizard using an example of the um, uh, of a demonstration farm with typical information uh, in it. So the Slurry Wizard was um, uh, initially uh, developed to help with uh, uh, NVZ compliance. So it's very NVZ related, uh, although uh, irrespective of NVZ, it's a, a useful tool to uh, explore uh, scenarios on farms with slurry storage and uh, the, uh, any changes that might be planned. So uh, looking at the, at the front page, uh, that, that is uh, first opened up. We've got some information here which we can enter. Uh, firstly, the number of cows, so size of herd and yield, uh, which is uh, which is relevant, of course. Uh, so that can be entered in the boxes. I hope you can see my cursor dancing around because uh, that's going to help enormously as we go through. Um, 
the other information here in this these cells is pre-populated uh, and it, it represents typical for these criteria here. Uh, they can be changed if uh, if a more relevant information is available uh, for a particular farm, but the um, uh, those are those are pre-populated as typical values, and there that information will be used in the calculations uh, further forward. So, having invented, uh, invested in the uh, in the initial information, we go through to the Surrey Wizard and uh, is asking us for uh, some more information. Uh, total farmable area here. We have uh, this case is 145 hectares, and uh, uh, of course that's the area of land available to the farm uh, for spreading manures. Uh, we need the telephone STD code and that's used to identify the location of the farm and therefore the uh, typical rainfall for that area. So that gets entered in there. Uh, uh, this information has come through forward from the front uh, screen, 200 cows. The cows in milk we can still uh, adjust that. And I've put 200 cows in there because this is a block calver and he's uh, gonna have all of his herd in milk for at least part of the year. The, um, uh, this information here has come through from the front page. And then we've got some more uh, data here, which is pre-populated uh, and can be changed as they're in white cells, can be changed um, for, uh, relevant uh, data for particular farms. Okay, uh, moving on down further, we then go into the uh, slurry storage capacity that's on the farms. And here we've got uh, an example of an earth bank lagoon. And uh, so uh, the, on, in this example, we have a four meter total depth. Uh, we have a, a length of 50 meters and a width of 30 meters. And uh, we have a slope factor of uh, one to one, uh, sorry, one to two point five. So we've chosen five there as a as a uh, indicator of the slope factor. Of course, the volume of a earth bank lagoon have to, has to take into account the uh, slope of the sides. It's a prismoid, and so uh, steeper slopes uh, have a different volume to shallower slopes. So that gives us the volume. Uh, we can uh, see here the volume there of that particular uh, lagoon uh, the, uh, and the working volume also, having taken account of the 750 millimeter freeboard requirement. Uh, so the working volume is uh, 2317, as you can see there. Uh, and if there were numerous lagoons, they'd all be added here and totaled at the bottom. We've also got the surface area uh, noted there. Moving on down, uh, this farm uh, has got additional storage as well. We could either enter in the uh, 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 oblong or square uh, storage uh, if, if there was any. Uh, this particular tin tank, 75 meters circumference of this tank, uh, and it's 3.7 meters deep, having taken account of the uh, 300 millimeter freeboard. Gives us a capacity of that and a surface area of that 448 square meters. We've got the option here to uh, cover that uh, lagoon, which will, if we tick that box, it will remove the surface area from the calculation. Moving down further, we have a um, opportunity here to, uh, to add a slurry separator, should there be one. And on this farm, there's not a slurry separator, so that's a no. Parlor washings um, can um, also be accounted for here. Uh, in that, the uh, in this case, parlor washings are going into the slurry store. Uh, there's an option, of course, to say no, uh, and uh, the volume of that is uh, identified as 30 liters per cow per day, and that um, uh, would represent a volume washer uh, on a on a typical uh, twice a day milking situation. 20 liters per cow per day might be more typical for. A washer perhaps uh, but that of course can be altered if if information relative rel relevant to the farm is known okay so that's parlor washings moving on down to the dirty yard area and uh, keeping it straightforward this farm's got one exposed yard where the uh, cows go out to uh, uh, eat from a from a feed trough 
and that's 27 meters by 17, uh, giving us this area of dirty yard. Moving down further, we've got roof water uh, that we can enter in here at various roofs. So we've got one cubicle shed on this farm that has got uh, a 66 meter length and 47 meter width, which gives us 3102 square roof area, which unfortunately at the moment is draining into the, the into the slurry lagoon because all the gutters are broken and the, um, the drainage is onto it onto the dirty yard. So back up to the top of the page, we've entered all that information. Uh, we then need to enter the uh, livestock data entry. Yeah, good, that has forwarded on, thank you. <laughs> and um, we can see uh, the opportunity here to uh, enter livestock for all classes of livestock, not just cows, of course, but there's other uh, classes, big sheep, horses, broilers, all sorts that obviously contribute um, to the manure on the farm. In this case, we've got a herd of 200 cows. Uh, there's yielding 8,500 litres, so they're in this bracket here. Um, and here we've got a, a column identifying the percent collected as slurry. So uh, this is not about grazing versus housing. This is about the percentage of the herd which is producing slurry. In this case, uh, dry cows are housed in straw yards, so therefore 80% of the herd is producing slurry. It produces uh, slurry at a rate of 53 litres uh, per cow per day. As standard figures uh, that is then calculated through to give us a volume of the volume of the slurry. Um, it also calculates the amount of nitrogen produced by those animals. Uh, um, in this class of livestock, we've got 101 um, kilograms of N per year produced by uh, these cows. Again, standard figures to give us a total amount of nitrogen produced in the year. So entering other classes of livestock that are on the farm, uh, we've got some uh, in-calf heifers, uh, young stock, in-calf heifers, 50 of those that uh, are contributing to the uh, livestock on the farm. They're also in cubicles, so 100% of their manure is slurry. We've got some bullying heifers, uh, next generation down, they're on straw yards, so none of their manure goes in as slurry, but of course they're still producing nitrogen. Moving down further, we've got 120 uh, beef cattle. Uh, this farmer keeps his uh, beef animals up to about a year old, so he's got 120 of those, all on straw yards, producing um, the nitrogen in this column here. He's got one bull, he's got 30 calves, and uh, scrolling down, he's got half a dozen sheep, which he keeps because um, he likes having a few sheep around. Uh, but they've, they've all been uh, calculated as producing the nitrogen. Right down at the bottom, um, <coughs> excuse me, we've got the total there, the, the total amount of nitrogen produced by all the livestock and the total amount of slurry produced uh, by the livestock. And a simple sum here that will give us kilograms of nitrogen per hectare based on the area of land we entered earlier. And uh, uh, you'll notice that 198 kilograms is above the uh, maximum permitted under NBZ rules. Um, so maybe we should address that at some point. Going back up to the top of the page, that's all the livestock um, are now entered. So we've got all the information in uh, and then we can go to the report. So here's the here's the slurry report. Um, and uh, we've got some more uh, information we can enter here in the white cells. This is uh, the percent going to the slurry store per month. So the year is broken down uh, into months, and uh, this is about whether the cows are housing or whether they're housed. Uh, this farm houses its cows in the middle of October. Uh, so 50% is collected as slurry during October, fully housed through the winter, and then in March, uh, so turn out mid-March. So the 50% um, uh, uh, collected in March. The remainder of the year, we've still entered 20% uh, in the remainder of the year because that would represent the amount uh, being collected 
uh, during milking or at least uh, collecting yards, dispersal yards, parlor, etc. The amount of slurry that gets dropped during that period would represent about 20% of it. So that, that gives us a picture or allows us to enter the picture for that farm and its grazing habits. So uh, we've got all the information we need. Uh, it's done the calculation. There's, uh, uh, there's no slurry separator. Uh, parlor washings there are based on the number of cows in milk and the number of days in the month. Uh, we've got rainfall figures. Now we've chosen a um, particular farm that is in a heavy uh, rainfall area. It happens to be that STD code you may have recognized as Burnley. Uh, and so it's a bit damp around Burnley and the rainfall figures uh, are reflected here. These figures come from a database which uh, draw on 30 year average rainfall figures. So uh, unfortunately, uh, as the name suggests, uh, uh, the average is just that, it's an average, uh, and 50% of the time, the rainfall will be in excess of the average. So we have to take account of the fact that there, are, there will be wetter years than the average. And this is the uh, introduction of the, this M5 calculation here, which gives us a, a figure that is uh, expected rainfall, or the rainfall that can be expected uh, during, those, uh, during those months, during those winter months. So those are the figures that are used in the calculation, uh, the M5 figures, unless, of course, uh, in the white cells here, individual rainfall figures are uh, entered. And if rainfall data uh, has been accurately kept over a number of years, then you, uh, that can be entered here and that will override the M5 calculation. We've got some runoff from, uh, uh, the, the, sorry, a yard runoff area into the slurry store. So uh, that's the dirty yard. Uh, we've got the rainfall that lands on top of the slurry stores. And we got the reef water from the cubicle shed, uh, all contributing to the slurry store. Here's our storage capacity, uh, 3975 cubic meters. And that's the capacity, total capacity we have. And as you can see, at the start of the winter, uh, the accumulation of slurry month by month means that the um, available capacity uh, goes down. And uh, sometime during December, you can see that we're in negative territory and the uh, slurry store will be overflowing if we, unless we do something about it. So that's highlighted the fact that this farm's not got sufficient storage. Whether or not he's in an NBZ, uh, he's still got insufficient storage. And so we need to do something about it. And we've got some action points here, which uh, will give us some pointers, uh, but we're looking over at here at the cost benefit box and one of the simple uh, easy quick wins is to do something about the roof water that's draining into the slurry uh, lagoon and so we can divert the roof water uh, mend all the gutters send that away elsewhere uh, and that will give us a cost benefit of something over twenty thousand pounds a year now that figure is based on the uh on the cost of the providing the guttering uh, uh, but it's also based on the cost of supplying the storage capacity, slurry storage capacity, that is required to hold that roof water. Uh, and in this case, to the tune of £40 per cubic meter, capital cost of slurry storage. Uh, and of course, the spreading cost as well. So the cost of spreading that water once it's been uh, captured. So you remember back at the at the uh, early on the early pages, those figures can be changed. So if the cost of, of providing the slurry storage was less, for example, if it was a earth bank lagoon, um, then that figure can be changed. That would change this uh, forty pounds a cubic meter figure, and hence change the cost benefit. Likewise, if the spreading cost was somewhat different, if it was particularly expensive to spread the slurry that could be entered and that would uh, feed into this cost benefit. Capital costs are uh, spread over however many years the depreciation is calculated depending on the data entered earlier on and the and an interest rate. 
uh, which obviously was entered earlier on as well. Um, so you can see there's, there's quite a substantial um, cost saving there that could be achieved uh, for installing a bit of guttering. So let's go back and do that. Uh, we can go back to this page, scroll down to where we've got our roof water area, and we can just eliminate that, put that to zero. We've now mended our gutters, no roof water going in there. Go through to the report again, and we see we've improved the situation. Uh, uh, we're still not compliant, we've still not got five months, uh, but it's a lot better than it was. Uh, <coughs> So the next trick um, we could uh, investigate is uh, roofing the dirty dirty yard, preventing rainwater getting on the dirty yard. Now the economics of this is uh, are not quite so straightforward, um, and, and it's suggesting here that uh, the um, cost benefit for just putting the roof up is negative. In fact, it costs more to uh, put a roof up than it does to uh, store the material and spread it. Uh, however, if the water is harvested and you can save water coming from the main, there is a minor benefit. So it's, there's a questionable uh, financial uh, advantage there. Uh, but uh, anyway, what we, we'll, we'll go in and implement that just to demonstrate what the, uh, what the scenario is. So we're now going to cover that yard and we've eliminated it from there. It's now not part of the, the issue. Go back to the report and we find ourselves uh, happily compliant so that's um that's a nice um position to be in that's very useful uh but we've got another issue to address and that is the amount of nitrogen produced um so we can go back to the livestock page and uh, as it happens because uh, the farmer needs to address this he's he's had a look at his accounts and he's decided that keeping beef cattle wasn't as profitable as he thought it was and so he's going to do away with his beef enterprise. So this is um, uh, going to go to zero. So no beef cattle is going to sell his beef cattle. And the, uh, the hobby sheep were obviously uh, uh, too intrusive at this time. So he's got rid of those as well. So he's now simplified his system and uh, he's got rid of some livestock from his farm. And lo and behold, he's now 170 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Um, which is just compliant, as you'll know. Um, so the next, uh, the next scenario is that this uh, farmer's son returns from college. And uh, he's an ambitious sort. He's learned lots of things at college, and he wants to up the output. So these beef cattle are all gone. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're going to replace them with some more cows. Um, so... We go back to the sorry we go back to the beginning go to the start here we go uh, back to the beginning again and we're going to now play what if uh, so what are what are the things that, that he wants to do he wants to increase the herd to 270 cows uh, he wants to push the yield up to 9500 liters uh, all these uh, bits of data are all the same so that's the base data let's go through to this first page we've got the same size farm uh, we've got live in the same area 270 cows. We've also got 270 cows of milk. Uh, so that goes in there. That will affect the parlor washings, of course. Uh, everything else uh, down here is the same storage, etc. That's not changed. Uh, we go through to the livestock page and we now need to enter 270 cows in there uh, because uh, the numbers have gone up. Get rid of those. Yield, the yield has gone up, of course, as well. So we're in a different category uh, here. We're still going to keep the dry cows on the straw. So that's 80%. We've got an increased number of uh, young stock uh, because the herd's bigger. So uh, we're going to claim 60 in calf heifers and about 45 uh, bulling heifers. Still no beef, uh, one bull. Uh, and 30 calves. So there's our livestock picture now. Um, let's go and see what that's done to the uh, slurry storage situation. And again, uh, as you might imagine, increased numbers of animals, increased slurry. We're uh, we're short on capacity again. Uh, the next uh, thing we might do, we can explore a possibility 
of installing a slurry separator. Uh, so there's the option here to put one in, and so we'll say yes, slurry separator, with a 20% reduction in volume. It's a fairly typical uh, machine that can reduce the volume by 20%. So uh, let's go and see what that's done to the slurry report. And yes, we are now compliant. That's uh, good news. But it's only just compliant. And uh, um, although the M5 figures give us a, 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 an expected rainfall, uh, there are times when it rains even more. Uh, and we need, bearing in mind the um, farming rules for water, uh, we need to ensure sufficient capacity in order to make use of the slurry at the optimum time uh, uh, and not um, be at any risk. So a little bit more cushion there would be useful. Uh, so before going investing in equipment, we could go back here and say, well, let's look at the uh, an improved model of slurry separator and go for one that will give us a 25% reduction in volume. Goes to the report, and that gives a little bit more cushion there, uh, a bit more comfort in the um, volume that we've got. Um, I'm sure if we go back to the livestock entry thing, our, our kilograms per hectare is now a problem to us. Well, we've now got 250 kilograms a hectare, so we have to address that. We may either, either have, to have to apply for a derogation, if one might be available, or we need to think about exporting slurry or getting hold of uh, some extra land somewhere. Uh, so that can be explored there. So that's a, that's a, a bit of a wander through Slurry Wizard and some of the uh, sort of features of it, which allows uh, the farmer or an advisor to uh, explore possibilities, ensure his compliance with uh, with regulations, and see what changes that he makes on the farm, what, what effect that might have on his um, slurry management. Um, that was that was um, an example of, of a particularly wet area. You remember that was in Burnley. Uh, we can uh, look at other um, scenario here. So we're back to the beginning again where we've still got the same demo farm, same number of cows, same yield as we started off with. Um, all the information is the same, except for the fact we've now moved the farm to a different location. It's now got a different STD code, and this is in Cambridge. And uh, not many dairy farms in Cambridge, but this one is. Uh, and so uh, a lot less rainfall. So all of the all the all of the statistics for the farm are the same, the same yard area, same roof area, etc. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, the same uh, same livestock numbers. And we go to the report, and it's not as bad as the uh, Burnley uh, sited farm, uh, because of course there's not nearly as much rainfall to deal with. Looking at the cost benefits, of course, the, the cost benefit is less uh, than it was uh, for the other farm because, of course, there's not so much uh, rainfall to uh, contend with. <coughs> as far as the uh, roofing the dirty yard goes, it's even more questionable in a financial, um, uh, the financial aspect of it is even more questionable uh, because, of course, there's not so much rainfall uh, to counter it. So we've still got a problem here. We've not got enough storage, um, but the, and the easy win again is the uh, roofing of the slurry. Uh, sorry, the cubicle shed. Roofing of the slur uh, cubicle shed. We we can get rid of that um, problem. We've mended all the gutters. They're now working fine. Uh, that roof water is not now going into slurry lagoon, and the report then suggests that we're compliant. In fact, we've got ample storage to see us through. Um, over over six months. So that um, uh, demonstrates that although uh, it can be identified, measures can be identified to uh, ensure compliance, it, it depends entirely on individual farm circumstances, uh, stocking levels, stocking rates, numbers of animals, yield levels, and of course location uh, uh, and subsequent rainfall. Uh, so I hope that's given you a little bit of a uh, insight into the um, operation of the slurry wizard and what it, what it can do. Uh, 
it's, it's purely a calculator that takes the um, uh, information supplied and gives a, an indication as to whether or not there is sufficient storage uh, on the farm for uh, the slurry being produced and the, and the nitrogen being produced from the livestock. Um, so I, uh, that's me done. I'm going to hand you now back to, uh, to Grace. Uh, and uh, if I can press the right button here, uh, we end up back there and I'm going to hand you back to Grace. Thank you very much, David. Uh, right, let's get the slides back on. Um, so that was the demonstration. Um, we are uh, well ahead of schedule. Um, so um, I'm just going to briefly say where you can find a little bit more information um, about managing slurry um, on our knowledge library back at AHTB website. Um, which I showed earlier. Um, we've got our Slurry Wizard um, page as well as the Slurry Wizard user guide. Um, as I said, that's really a useful guide to help you find your way through that tool. Um, as well as that, we also have um, some new slurry and manure pages. Uh, these are being updated all the time. Um, we have um, some pages specifically for our RB209 section on organic manures. Um, information there on slurry cooling. Uh, we are currently in the process of updating our uh, pages on slurry stores and different types of covers and um, some of the legislation around uh, covering slurry stores as well. So that's so they're available uh, to yourselves and to farmers. Um, as I said, that's still work in progress. So uh, keep an eye out for some of the updates on that page. Um, so uh, we are um, running up to time. We've got a little bit more time for questions than we thought. Um, before we get on to questions, I just want to let you know um, you can find out more about the HTB events on htb.org.uk forward slash events. Um, there's some more webinars coming up, which you might find interesting. Um, also, my details and David's details are on this slide um, and online. Um, uh, so you can access us, um, by, contact us via our emails if you have any other questions uh, that might come to you after this webinar and if we don't get a chance to answer them here today. Um, and finally, we really do appreciate uh, any feedback that you have from uh, these webinars. It's our only way to improve and get better. So um, please hang on till the end of the webinar and um, there'll be an opportunity to fill in some feedback there. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to questions now. Um, let me see. Just bear with me. Okay. Um, right, so... Time from uh, the top, um, we have a question. Uh, does slurry wizard calculations take into account climate change, especially in relation to the high rainfall last year and the slurry related impacts? If not, is this planned? Um, so David's here with me now. So um, if you uh, want to address the question whether- Yep, um, the, um, uh, any effects of climate change have not yet been uh, built into the slurry wizard. Um, it takes the uh, historic 30 year average rainfall and then applies the M5 calculation to it. Uh, so it is historic data uh, that's used for rainfall. Uh, but the, um, there is the opportunity, you'll remember in the report slide, to enter uh, farm relative uh, rainfall data. So that can be uh, manipulated to show uh, the rainfall from uh, the extreme years. Uh, I hope that helps. Okay, um, next question. Uh, what are the parlour washings likely to be for just two robotic milkers? Tricky one, David. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder when this one was coming up. Um, <laughs> yes, of course, the, um, the slurry wizard uh, assumes that uh, uh, cows are being milked uh, traditionally through a milking parlour. Uh, and using a range of um, 
uh, litres of water per cow. But it doesn't yet have the facility uh, uh, or, or range of facilities to accommodate all sorts of different milking systems. That's something that we've got planned in an upgrade to the wizard, uh, which hopefully will come in the next year or so, and that we can uh, incorporate a more comprehensive uh, water use uh, section. Uh, but with the uh, parlor washings uh, entry section, data entry section, uh, there is uh, the ability to say whether you're using 20 litres, 30 litres, or, or however many litres of, of water per cow per day. So in a robot situation, if, um, if the farm is able to provide information about how much water is used, then that can be entered uh, as farm specific information. Okay. Okay, um, another one, I think this is more of a statement potentially than a question. Uh, we could also use this tool or recommended advisors or agents um, do so to justify slurry store covers and benefit reducing ammonia emissions. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, this is a really good um, example of why showing and demonstrating to farmers um, how much they could reduce their slurry capacity need if they had a, a cover to yeah. keep out the water. So yeah, absolutely. Um, um, another one here. Um, please could we also mention the countryside stewardship water capital grants may be available in some areas covered by CSF. Yeah, absolutely excellent point. Um, so yeah, um, it's also definitely worth mentioning those grants are out there. Um, Another comment. Um, thanks, very useful. Uh, countryside stewardship grants are available for roofing, slurry stores, uh, CSFOs can help farmers in high water priority areas with advice and grants on this. Yes, that's definitely, um, that's right. So that's uh, definitely worth mentioning too. Um, here's, we do have a question here. Um, could you just confirm that rainfall on Lagoon was taken into account in capacity calculation. Yes. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, um, the um, the astute ones amongst you would notice that um, the Earthbank Lagoon um, uh, entry area doesn't yet have the ability to tick a box to say this lagoon is covered, and so the air, the surface area of an Earthbank Lagoon. Uh, it's automatically capturing water and the volume of water goes into the into the calculation. However, the other uh, storage options, both the square, rectangular and circular stores, above ground stores, uh, have got the opportunity to tick a box to say this store is covered. Uh, for example, it might apply to uh, a store underneath the shed, underneath slats, in which case uh, you could tick the box to say covered and it will uh, not add in the rainfall landing on that area. But uh, to answer the question, yes, rainfall landing on the store is uh, added into the calculation. Thanks, David. Um, another comment, um, countryside stewardship grants um, are also available for roofing livestock collecting yards. That's a really valid point as well. Um, yeah, uh, the, uh, you, you'll, you'll remember that um, the installation of uh, or repair of decent guttering was uh, a bit of a no-brainer and the uh, economic benefit of doing that uh, was certainly well worth uh, investing in. The covering of an open yard is financially not so straightforward. Uh, more so perhaps in a heavy rainfall area than it is in a light rainfall area. And uh, and so the uh, taking advantage of uh, grants that are available for covering uh, the livestock yards uh, is a good way of helping to achieve that. Thank you. Um, another one, can we update Slurry Wizard to look at closing systems to minimize ammonia emission losses uh, given potential future legislation, please? Um, well, we are looking for future updates for the Slurry Wizard, um, as David already mentioned about the robots is one thing, um, but yeah, I think that's a really valid point. I think that's something we definitely can 
looking yeah. into. Um, well, uh, thanks for that comment. We yeah. will um, we will take that one on board. It's a whole uh, different area, of course, because we would have to incorporate um, emission factors from uh, open lagoons, etc. Uh, but it's um, uh, given the climate that we've got, um, then it could well be something that would be beneficial to incorporate. So thanks for the uh, comment. Um, another question here, does the EA recognize it as NVZ compliant? Good question. Um, yes, yes, uh, it is recognized by the EA as, uh, as being able to demonstrate compliance and uh, uh, the environment agency do um, uh, take the information from it as, as a uh, demonstration that the farm is, is uh, compliant with NVZs. Uh, a recent upgrade uh, that we made to it a year, year or two ago has uh, ensured that, uh, and that was the introduction of the M5 calculation for rainfall and the uh, calculation for volume of a prismoid, the, uh, uh, the Earth Bank Lagoon with the slopey sides. Uh, having introduced those two uh, upgrades, up enhancements, if you like, uh, then it, it is now recognised by the EA. Um, another good question here. Uh, can you use your own slurry analysis for the N calculation? Mm. Um, there's not a facility within the calculator, within the wizard, to enter your own N production. They're use, it's using standard figures, uh, the 101 kilograms a year, for example. Uh, that's the that's what's used in the calculation uh if um if you have different information uh then i guess that could be used uh in a, in your own calculation uh that would have to be um negotiated if you like with a, with the ea uh, to demonstrate compliance but there's there's no facility within the wizard to um, put in different um, nitrogen calculations um, um, I've got one uh, question about basis points. Um, how do we obtain basis points and can we have more information on the M5 factor? Um, I think that if you pop your, um, your basis membership number down um, uh, along with your postcode address into these into the um, comment section here, um, we can get that sorted for you. Um, and more information on the M5 factor, David. Uh, yes, uh, good question. I um, uh, I don't have that information in front of me, uh, but it's a formula, uh, and uh, we can supply that. Uh, I'm sure we can get that to all the attendees um, yeah. uh, uh, after the event. Very, it's a very simple formula. Okay, um, another one. I have noticed the STD code really underestimates the amount of uh, rainfall. I would recommend that all farmers check their rainfall figures. If they don't have uh, own figures, the EA can help with M5 figures, which could avoid potentially costly mistakes being made by stores being undersized. Uh, useful point, thank you for that. Um, but the um, uh... And it is true, the, uh, even the M5 figure is based on an average uh, rainfall, uh, average rainfall data. So if we accept the fact that rainfall uh, is increasing or becoming more erratic, uh, then those 30 year average uh, figures are not so um, uh, accurate, perhaps, uh, where more local uh, farm registered rainfall might be of use uh, to be able to provide a uh, a, a more local picture, uh, but also the STT code uh, figures uh, don't take account of re very local uh, variations. So you can get rain shadows uh, within uh, a dialing code area that aren't reflected within the within the data. Um, this one's a um, another. Um, more of a, I think of a comment, but um, I have also used the slurry wizard for calculating pig slurry storage capacity, but it's not obvious that it can be used for this as well. Perhaps this can be promoted. Is there anything we should be 
um, aware of when using it for pig slurry capacity calculations? Uh, yes, well, um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's, it, it wasn't um, uh, its target audience, it wasn't uh, uh, the pig industry, but you're right, it can be used for that because it's got the, the data in there about the production of slurry from various classes of, uh, of pig and, uh, and nitrogen also. Uh, so it can be used purely as a, as a production uh, uh, model. I mean, the entries such as parlor washings become a, a little bit irrelevant, uh, but uh, it can be used uh, for pigs uh, as well. Okay, uh, another one for rainfall. Can rainfall data for all the regions of the UK be included? Uh, yes, yes, there are, uh, there's there's a whole range. Whatever STD code uh, you care to put in, uh, there there is a database behind that with all the rainfall figures in. Um, uh, dialing code areas can be large. Any plans for more detailed rainfall info? Uh, no definite plans at the moment, although, as I suggested, we have got plans that, uh, that we've got an upgrade uh, uh, coming down the tracks. That we, uh, there are various areas of the wizard which we know could be quite easily enhanced and, uh, and give a more accurate picture and uh, accessing better rainfall data data would be uh, an area that we could look at. Okay, um, this one's a, a comment. I, I don't think MVZ's legislation allows own figures to be used. Um, I think uh, this is presumably rainfall figures uh, and I think that uh, if accurate records uh, can be verified as relevant to that particular location and can be justified as accurate, then uh, I don't see any reason why own figures can't be used and uh, as long as, as, long as they're, they're accurate and can be justified. Oh, I, see. I see he's just um, put another question. Uh, um, person. Uh, he said, no, I meant for N figures, MVZs to allow rainfall figures. Oh, sorry. Figures. Um, yeah. Um, uh, nitrogen yes. production figures. Um, and so back to the original question, uh, I don't think NVZ's legislation allows own figures to be used. So this is own nitrogen production figures. Um, now, I, 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 I wouldn't um, uh, disagree with that. I think that's probably a, a, an accurate um, uh, comment. So thanks for that. Okay, um, let's see, we've got a few. I think that might be the last of the questions we have now. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that might be uh, all the questions we have left. Um, so we are finishing a little bit earlier, um, but unless we have any other last minute questions, um, I think we will call that um, the end of, call the end of the webinar. Um, as I said, please do leave us some feedback. Um, it's really important for us to improve our webinars in the future and uh, it's greatly received. Um, so thank you so much for dialing in and listening today. Um, and if you do have any other further questions, um, then don't hesitate to get in touch. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>